Well, good morning, Community Bible Church. Welcome to our service this morning. Let's stand as we begin our service by singing about how there's joy in praising our God. Yeah. 
Well, if you've been reading the e-bulletin that we send out or the link, um, you've seen that uh, we got a couple of, uh, one major change coming up and then a couple of announce, uh, a couple of events that are coming up. The first one is the missions conference, and that is taking place from April 17 to 24 uh, here at CBC. It's a great time where we uh, focus on uh, what God is doing around the world. We get to hear from our global partners. Uh, and just, uh, it's, a, it's a good time where we can focus on God's mission uh, and what that means for us. Uh, if you want more information about that, it's on the website. You'll hear more about it next week uh, as well. Um, another uh, event that we have coming up is, if you're newer to CBC, we'd love to get to know you. On April 16th, we're having a Discover CBC dinner. Uh, that's something you need to sign up for. Um, but if you are newer to CBC and you want to kind of hear from the pastors, hear about the church, uh, then that is a great opportunity uh, for you to come and uh, hear. That's going to be here at the church on April 16th. Uh, you can sign up. There, Renee will be in our information center there uh, with a computer, and she'll be able to sign you up for that. Um, the big change that we have coming up is that we are moving our directory away from Breeze to Planning Center. Uh, a church center is planning center's kind of church directory wing, so you might hear those two terms, planning center and church center, are used interchangeably uh, a little bit. So today, uh, after this service, probably around one o'clock, you will receive an email uh, that looks like this, except for obviously it'll be your name and not mine. And so this will, it might go to spam or to junk uh, or something like that. Um, but if you click on join directory, uh, you can see there, uh, you can put in your phone number and that will text you a code. Or if you want to use email, you can throw in your email address there and it would be the same email address that that uh, invitation came to. After you do that, you'll get sent a code. You'll put that code in and then that'll take you to uh, the next page is the login uh, right there. There is no password to remember. Uh, it's if you get logged out, that will uh, be. You'll just have to go through the same code process uh, to to do that. Yes, Jeff. Do we do one per family or one per person? One per person. One per person. Yep. Um, great question. Uh, so the uh, yeah, if you ever get logged out, yeah. Once you do this, you'll need to share your profile so that others uh, can see your profile too which is right there, it'll say share it now, you'll click on that, and then you'll get to decide what information you want shared. If it's just your photo, then that's what you want to share, then that's great. There is also an option on here to where you can hide your contact information if you don't want it just out there, and then through the directory, you can message people if they've had their, um, if they have their contact information hidden, you can message them and that'll go to their email, but no contact information will be shared until they respond. So if you still want to be connect contacted, but don't necessarily want your phone number uh, out there, then that is a great way to still be connected uh, while maintaining uh, that level of, whatever level of safety and security you would like. Um, you do need to set up an account in order to view the directory and to be viewable in the directory. Um, so we are using Planning Center in a lot of different areas in church too, so this just makes it a lot easier for leadership to kind of know everything and people who are scheduling. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about that, 
we will have people in the lobby next Sunday and the Sunday after that will can help you get your account set up. If you didn't receive the email, we can get you added to the directory. Uh, so we're trying to uh, hopefully make everybody who uh, a part of this because it's a great way for us to um, just connect with each other uh, as as this church. So uh, yeah, let's as we uh, continue worshiping this morning, uh, let's stand. Uh, I'm going to read a passage from Psalm 65 as we prepare to sing worship through song uh, this morning. Psalm 65, we read, "You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior." You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. And we're here to worship that great God. So let's sing together.
for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you? God, we thank you for the truth and the words that we have sung. We thank you that you are the God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and provides for us. God, we thank you that you listen and hear and answer our prayers in your own timing and according to your will. God, we thank you that we can hold fast to your goodness shown to us in times of, of need. We pray now as we turn and study your word that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand more about you and who you are and how you relate to us this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Worship team, good morning. Community Bible, wonderful to worship with you uh, this morning. I uh, appreciate so much the work that Tim and uh, I think Seth Guthrie probably has been involved there, Renee as well, um, in uh, bringing together this uh, move from Breeze, which some of you, I hope a lot of you are familiar with and are using, it's our current church directory, uh, to uh, the planning center, which will be a, a more effective way, I think, of, of uh, helping us as a church connect with one another. I, I read something uh, from a friend who sent me a little text this past week, actually, I think it was John Stott. It was a quote from John Stott. It was a prophetic quote said years and years ago, I think maybe as many as 40 or 50 years ago, he made reference to um, how technology oftentimes uh, will draw us apart from one another in the body of Christ. And I think we've seen that. Uh, it's, It's a blessing. It's something that is wonderful to use, but it doesn't necessarily automatically draw us closer together as people. And in fact, at times, it will do just the exact opposite of that. Case in point would be uh, those who are home this morning watching this service, not because they have to be, but because that's the choice they've made. It's not a wise choice, um, but uh, we're, gra- we're grateful to have them joining us in this hour. Uh, but many of them could come and be a part of our face-to-face worship time. And that is important. The Bible makes it clear that that's important. Our connection to one another as believers is important. So technology has a way that is, well, it it blesses our lives, but it also at times draws us apart from one another. And I think uh, the the system that's being worked on and put in place and that you can join and be a part of, uh, you will benefit from because it will help you to get to know others in the body of Christ. We're a big enough church that that can be a challenge at times. And yet uh, there is a way to do that, and I want to strongly encourage you to join that planning center, to go ahead and put your name and basic information in there so that we have 
that way of connecting with you and that you can connect with others in the body of Christ. Renee is going to be um, over here by the information center after this hour. And is that, you're not going to deal with that. Well, you're going you're gonna to also be able to help them with that. But she is also going to be there to help you sign up for what Tim mentioned that's coming April 16. And April 16 is a Tuesday night, starts at 6 o'clock, and many of you have never been to a Discover CBC. Well, this is your opportunity to come, hear from our staff, and just learn a little bit about the church, things maybe that you haven't heard before or you don't know. We want to encourage you to set aside an hour, essentially, from about 6 to 7.15 and be a part of that time. If you're interested in that, you have to sign up. There's a meal that will be provided, uh, and there will be a brief time of sharing. And Renee, could you stand so everybody knows who you are? This is who you're going to connect with after the service over here, if you don't know who Renee is. And uh, she'll help you get signed up for that Discover CBC. A couple of ways that you can connect to others in the body of Christ. Well, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. We come back to the Sermon on the Mount and to this uh, message that Jesus gave to his disciples. By the time he gets to the end of the message, there are people who have joined in with that group, and they're now able to uh, listen as, as well to what Jesus is sharing. But in Matthew chapter 7, uh, we have really the conclusion of Jesus' message that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a subject, uh, or the subject we come to today is the subject of prayer. And uh, I want to begin by reading for you uh, the words of D.A. Carson. Don Carson is <clears throat> a New Testament scholar, author, And he writes and observes this. He says, The Western world is not characterized by prayer. By and large, to our unspeakable shame, even genuine Christians in the West are not characterized by prayer. Our environment loves hustle and bustle, smooth organization and powerful institutions, human self-confidence and human achievement, new opinions and novel schemes. And the Church of Jesus Christ has conformed so thoroughly to this environment that it is often difficult to see how it differs in these matters from contemporary paganism. There are, of course, exceptions, but I am referring to what is characteristic. Our low spiritual ebb is directly traceable to the flickering feebleness of our prayers. You have not because you do not ask. Words that, uh, well, they pierce our heart, I trust, as we think about the challenges maybe of our own prayer life. Today, we conclude Jesus' sermon on the mount as he talks to us about prayer and tells us that we have a wonderful Heavenly Father who loves to give us good things. He knows just what to give us. He knows how to give it just at the right time and in the right way. And because of that, we should pray. We should pray. We should keep on praying because we have that kind of a heavenly father. I mentioned that we're coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. If you look at your Bible in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12 today, and that effectively is the end of Jesus' sermon. Because the rest of it, well, it's a message, it's a part of the Sermon on the Mount, but it isn't a part of the central part of his message. That actually began back in chapter 5 and verse 17, after he gives the Beatitudes and calls us to be salt and light, He really begins his sermon, the the thrust of it, the heart of it, the central tenets of it, in verse 17 of chapter 5, which reads like this, do you not think, or rather do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets? I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Notice he mentions the law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures. And now look at chapter 7 in verse 12, the very last verse of the main part of the Sermon on the Mount. He writes and says, or Matthew writes for us Jesus' words in verse 12, in everything, Jesus said, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And you remember the term inclusio, which is a literary device that Jesus is using, introducing in chapter 5 and verse 17, the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets, and now concluding with that in chapter 7 and verse 12. And everything in between, he's talking about, of course, righteous living as God would define that, not as we would, as God would define it, and how it's worked out in our lives. And he comes now to the subject of prayer 
in chapter 7. In fact, chapter 7, as we saw last week, focuses on our relationship first with our fellow disciples and then with those who are opposed to the cause of Christ. Today we're going to look at the last two of those where he talks about our relationship to our Heavenly Father and then our relationship to everybody, to all people. You remember two weeks ago, actually, before Easter, we were thinking together about the opening verses of chapter 7 where Jesus in the first five verses told us to stop being judgmental toward our brothers and sisters. Now, he didn't use that terminology. He didn't say brother and sister in Christ because the church hasn't started yet. He's talking to fellow disciples. He's talking to those who have, at some, at some level, embraced him as the Messiah. They don't have full understanding of all that means, but they're following Jesus and they believe him to be the one that the Old Testament scriptures had pointed toward And Jesus sits down now on this mountainside and begins to teach and preach. And at this point in his message, he begins to talk about what it's like for disciples and how they're going to relate to those around them. And the first five verses deal with this subject of what's our relationship to fellow disciples? Today, we would say to brothers and sisters in Christ, to one another. And Jesus, in in very forthright language, says, stop judging one another. Stop being critical toward one another. Stop having a judgmental attitude toward one another. In those areas of life where we might differ in particular, stop being judgmental and realize that people are going to make different decisions that are nonetheless uh, godly decisions before the Lord. And so we are to stop being critical or having a judgmental attitude. And then we also looked at the sixth verse, which talked about our relationship with people who would be opposed to the cause of Christ. Do we continue to share truth with them? Well, Jesus says if you do that and they simply uh, ridicule it or make, it, make fun of it and, and they disregard it, that would be tantamount to us taking a nice pearl necklace and throwing it to the pigs. What would the pig know to do with a pearl necklace? They would simply trample it underfoot. Here Jesus says instead of of continuing to share truth with those who make fun of it and disregard it and don't receive it, be discerning. Be discerning, right? Stop being judgmental toward those that are fellow disciples and be discerning toward those on the outside so that you don't continue to just throw truth before them. And that will require, of course, that a judgment be made that we use discernment and we have the wisdom today that the Holy Spirit would give us. Today we come to the last two relationships that Jesus talks about. In verses 7 through 11, it's the relationship that we have as followers of Christ with our Heavenly Father. And what does He tell us? He tells us, keep praying. Pray and keep praying. And don't stop praying. And then He concludes in verse 12 when He talks about our relationship with everyone. And He says, treat people the way that you want them to treat you. Treat people the way you want to be treated And so we come to verses 7 through 11, where we find our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And there's basically two points here. One is that Jesus gives a command and a promise, and those go together. You're going to ask, you're going to seek, you're going to knock, and guess what? You're going to receive, you're going to find, and the door is going to be opened. That's the promise that Jesus gives. When you ask, you'll receive. When you seek, you'll find. When you knock, it will be opened. But then he goes on and also illustrates that. And he does it in a powerful way that drives home the point that he's giving us here. So let's look at these verses that uh, begin in verse 7. Do you know that Jesus said more about prayer than any other topic in the Sermon on the Mount? And I find that interesting in light of who he's talking to. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to to followers of his, those who have a heart for, for, for God and wanting to be pleasing to the Lord. That's our heart today. These are words that that uh, certainly can be applied to our lives, even they're not addressed directly to us. They're, direct, they're directed to people that are living uh, before the cross and before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they certainly have application to us, and Jesus spends more time on prayer than on any other subject in his sermon. You know what the second subject is? The second longest subject that he addresses is worry. <laughs> and I think how oftentimes... Those go together, right? You worry about things, what should you do? Oh, you pray. That'll help you in in being worrisome as you pray and call out to the Lord. Well, here, God has determined, of course, that that, uh, this is how He'll work. 
He will work as I pray, as you pray. This is how he's determined to, to use us and, and, and to help us, not only as individuals, uh, but also, of course, the world around us. He, he could simply sit back in heaven and say, hey, as needs arise, I'm just going to take care of them. No one has to ask for anything. I know everything already anyway. I know all that needs to be done. I'll just do it at the right time, at the perfect time, and I'll provide for everyone's needs just as is, is necessary uh, around the world, right? Without them having to ask me, without them having to seek, without them having to knock. But that's not what he did. That's, now how, that's not how he has determined uh, to work. His will is that you and I would ask, seek, and knock. That we would pray, and that we would keep on praying. And certainly, even if I don't understand or appreciate the fact that he's asking me to do that, and this is the determined plan that he has in terms of how he'll work with us in the world in which we live, I have to understand because of who he is that this is certainly the best. I might think, well, this would really be nice if I didn't have to ask for anything. If I just needed something, boom, it would be a part of my life. God would see it and he'd provide it for me. That seems like a great way of living. But there must be something, even if I don't fully understand it, that would be to our disadvantage. Because God is wise and all of His ways are perfect. And so what He's determined here in terms of of how we relate to Him as our Heavenly Father, by asking and seeking and knocking, must be for our good. Yes, He commands us to pray, to ask Him to work on our behalf, and of course, not just for us, but for everything we pray for so that we can be involved in what he's doing look at the first two verses seven and eight where he gives a command and with each command there's a promise that's given jesus says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened now these are familiar words aren't they this asking and seeking and knocking are well known to us. Do you know that these are commands? He's not suggesting something here. He's saying to us as a command, as an imperative, that we are to ask, we're to seek, and we're to knock. Three commands are given. Three imperatives. Three things that we must do, that He calls us to do as His followers. And Matthew, as he records the words of Jesus, puts those three commands in the present tense. So that means that what we, could, what we see here in verses 7 and 8 could be translated this way. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. It's not a one and done kind of thing. He doesn't say, hey, go ahead and ask. And when you've done asked for that, you don't have to ask for anything ever again. That's not the, the tense of the, of the language here at all. Instead, it is, well, there's a stress on continuous action. On something that's ongoing, that doesn't stop, that's constant that is unbroken. And so he tells us, keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. And as you do, you will receive, you will find, and it will be opened to you. The idea is certainly one of persistence. He's calling us to, to without hesitation, uh, continue to persist in asking God for the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Have you ever found yourself in your prayer life wishing somehow to pray for the same thing but using a little bit different kind of language because you've prayed for that thing so many times, maybe every day, several times a day, you're asking God to do something. You're asking for His help in some way. But it seems to almost become rote and meaningless to you because you've said it so many times. Jesus here is saying that God is looking for that kind of prayer. He's looking for that kind of a person who will be persistent in asking for the same thing over and over again. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The emphasis is on persistence. Now, one of the questions you have to ask and answer as you seek to understand what Jesus is saying here, is he using these three terms, ask, seek, and knock, as synonymous terms? Are they synonyms? 
Or is he saying something else? Is he building something? Is there a progression? Do you ask and then you seek and then you knock? Some would say there's, an, there's a growing intensity here. As I considered that this past week, I thought maybe it was best to simply understand that Jesus was using these three ways as a, as a clever and a helpful way to help us remember what he's saying but that he's using them more or less as synonyms. I mean, how memorable this is to ask, to seek, and to knock. Then simply say, hey, don't forget to pray. And keep on praying. He's telling us here something, I think, that helps us to see how we ought to pray. And I think probably it's best to understand that they're synonyms. Others don't understand that that way. They would understand that asking here is, well, it's... It's a word that that simply means uh, to ask of something or someone who is in a superior position to you. It's not the most common word that we find in the New Testament for prayer. That's not the word that Matthew uses here as he records Jesus' words. That's a word that that oftentimes is a very broad word. It It could... It could be involving requests, things we're asking God to do. It could be worship or praise. It could be praying for someone else. That's the most common word that we have in the New Testament for prayer. It's a broad word. This is a more focused word. And it's a word that means to ask, to request of someone, usually in a superior role than you, someone who is able to respond and give you what you're asking for. We, we do this all the time, of course. If you, if you want some time off of work, you go into your boss, to your superior, and you say, hey, I'd like to have Friday off. Could I have Friday off? You're asking as a person who's in an inferior position to someone who is over you. And that's the very meaning of this word here. It indicates a request that's being made. We pray this way all the time. Because we realize that this is a large part of prayer. It's not the only aspect of prayer. But it's a large part of what we do as we talk to our Heavenly Father. We ask for things that we believe are good and that God would be pleased to give us because He is a good Heavenly Father. So that's the idea of that first word. Seek simply means to look for. But people have oftentimes, if they see a progression here or a a growing intensity, have suggested that what Jesus means here is asking plus acting upon what you're asking for. So it'd be like if you're praying for a person you know that doesn't know the Lord. And you're praying for this person's salvation, that they'll come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that He died and rose again for them. He paid the penalty for their sin. That they would understand the gospel. They would understand the need they have to be saved, to have a Savior, and that Jesus is the only Savior. So you pray, and you keep praying. But you also, well, when opportunity's there, you share the gospel with them, don't you? You maybe share resources, you have spiritual conversations, you talk about things, you answer questions they might have. People would suggest that this is the idea that Jesus has in mind when he says, don't just ask, but also seek. Or maybe uh, for some of you, uh, as you uh, finish out your college or your high school years, uh, you're wondering, you know, what college you're going to go to, or if you're going to go to college at all. And so you begin to pray about that, and you ask for God's guidance and direction and wisdom and helping you make a good choice. But you don't just pray about the college you're going to go to. You, you begin to go online, and you look at different colleges, and you're gathering information, and you get material so that you can read about the colleges. That's what some would say Jesus is talking about here. It isn't just the idea of asking, but it's the idea of putting some kind of action to our asking. I suppose it'd be a little bit like the woman in Luke chapter 15. She has 10 very valuable coins. You remember the parable that Jesus told? And uh, what? She loses one. So she begins to look for it. She, she, she seeks diligently to find it. In fact, she takes the broom, she sweeps the house, probably a, what, a dirt floor, and she's sweeping and she's trying to gather that, that lost coin. Now the point isn't what we're talking about here in Matthew chapter 7. But certainly we can understand what it's like for that woman to have lost one of these valuable coins. Or when we ourselves lose something that has some value to us and we hunt and we look for it all over the house. We're seeking it. 
We may be praying at the same time. God, help me to find this. But we don't just sit back and expect God to kind of plop it, plop it in our laps. No, we're, we're putting some action to it. And then those who would see the progression also would understand knock as more than just a knocking. Here again, it would imply a desire to be an, you know, invited into a personal relationship or some kind of interaction. Uh, and, and indeed, that oftentimes, of course, uh, is, is the case as we seek to be a part of someone's life and get to know them. So, in fact, in a parallel passage, you remember the teaching of Jesus in another parable, in Luke chapter 11, where it is um, the story that Jesus tells is you have a friend that comes, and it's late at night already, but here's this unexpected visitor. And the visitor comes, and you hear the knock at the door, and you go, and, and yeah, who is it? You know, the kids are down, they're already sleeping, and you hear the knock, and it's... It's you, you're rather, you're the one who's knocking and, and you're, you're looking for your friend, your next door neighbor to, to provide you some, vi- some, some bread for this unexpected visitor. And what does your neighbor friend say? They say, say, oh yeah, hang on just a minute, I'll get that for you. He says, no, go away. The kids are already sleeping. Imagine Palestine, a one room house, the kids and everybody, the family right there on the floor. They're not tucked away in their private bedrooms. They're right there. If he opens the door and goes through all this process of finding bread for his friend, for you, well, that's going to disturb the whole, the whole evening. He doesn't want to start over again. He doesn't want to deal with that. So he simply says, go away. But the point that Jesus makes is, why does your friend get up and interrupt the sleep of his family and bring you that bread that you need because this friend has visited unexpectedly? Is it because he's just a good buddy? No. It's because you're persistent. The knock is not going to stop knocking, right? You're not going to give up until he comes to the door and brings you the bread. Now, that's the point that Jesus seems to have here, certainly, as he tells us to act, to ask, to seek, and to knock, and to do it persistently, to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Just as I considered those three words in the context here in these first two verses this past week, I thought, well, there doesn't really seem to be anything very clearly here that would indicate a progression. And this is very typical of the way that Jesus taught. He oftentimes gave gave us examples of three. So here again, three words that I think are more than anything synonymous for don't ever stop praying. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Be persistent. Don't ever stop praying. So the, the NET Bible, the NET Bible, has study notes, and it says this about these verses. The three imperatives, these three commands, ask, seek, and knock, in this verse are probably intended to call for a repeated or continual approach before God. And I think um, that summarizes Jesus' words here and the urgency that should be a part of our hearts and minds as we encounter uh, the things uh, uh, that are a part of our lives And we bring those things to the Lord. We don't ever want to stop asking, seeking, and knocking. We want to be persistent in prayer. In fact, the Bible never discourages us from coming to God repeatedly. If you look back in chapter 6, you'll recall that we skipped over a portion of the 6th chapter. We're going to come back in the summer months and we're going to look at chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. And it's there that Jesus did say, hey, I don't want to hear repeated meaningless phrases. Don't come just say things that aren't a part of your heart or thought process. Don't just repeat a bunch of words thinking that that's going to move me because that isn't the way we should pray. And then he gives us an example of how we should pray with the Lord's Prayer, what more properly would be known as the way that his disciples would, would pray. And a part of that, of course, is this admonition of not coming uh, with just the same phrases over and over and over again, thinking somehow that's going to move the hand of God. It isn't. But the scriptures, well, they correspond very nicely with what Jesus is saying here as we come repeatedly over and over again, and we unabashedly persist in asking and in seeking and in knocking, asking God for what we need. In fact, this is the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, where there's a widow 
who comes before an unjust judge, right? And she's saying, I need justice. Give me justice. Jesus doesn't go into explaining what the the widow's need was, but she had a need. And she wasn't going to stop coming to the judge and asking the judge to do what she needed done. And over and over and over, she would come. The judge didn't care. He was an unjust judge. He didn't care one whit about this widow and about her life circumstances. So why did he eventually give in and do what she was asking? Because she was persistent. And he said to himself, if, if, if I don't give this widow what she wants, she's never going to go away. And I'm tired of her bothering me. And so he makes the move to do what is good for her. Now, the thing that's most striking, of course, about that parable is that our Heavenly Father is nothing like the unjust judge. He is anxious to give us what is good and best for us. And of course, omniscient, so he knows exactly what we need and when we need it. Or a passage like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, which tells us to pray without ceasing. Jesus is urging us here to pray in a way that would be persistent. Don't stop asking God for the things you're asking God for. Keep on praying. I I suppose as you read those words and you you see the promise that is given then in in each one of these. If you ask, you'll receive. If if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the promise is it will be opened. But the question is that comes to mind is why does God want us to be persistent in prayer? What's the point of it all? It it certainly can't be to, to better inform Him It's not like if I come a second or a third or a fourth time or a a tenth time or a one hundredth time that he's somehow going to have all the information he needs now to answer this prayer in the way he needs to answer it. Uh, We would reject that. Uh, It certainly isn't because it takes time to work out what he's going to do for us. He can do whatever he wants whenever he wants. It isn't because uh, he he needs to know more. It isn't because... um, it's just going to take lots more time to work things through. Like a, like a kid who would say uh, to his parent, Mom, um, you know, please, can I go, please? And a little bit later, Mom, can I please go? I want to go, please let me go. And then a little bit later, Mom, can I please go, please, please, can I go? I mean, after a while, you get sick of that as a parent, don't you? And you just give in and say, yeah, okay, you can go. <laughs> uh, that's, not our, that's not our Heavenly Father. He, do, he doesn't do it for that reason. And He's not calling us to be persistent for any of those reasons. Well, well then why? Well, I think there is an answer. And the answer is actually simple and yet too profound for us really to appreciate or fully understand. The answer is that it's not about Him. It's about us. He wants us to be persistent about prayer. Not so something changes in his experience or thinking, but so that something changes for us. It's not about him. It's about us. J. Oswald Sanders says it this way, God does not always grant the answer to prayer at once because the petitioner is not yet in in a fit state to receive what he asks. There is something God desires to do in him before he answers the prayer. Did you catch that last line? There is something God desires to do in him before he answers the prayer. I suppose probably more often than not, we don't know what that is. We simply see this need And we call out to God. We're asking, seeking, we're knocking. We're saying, provide this. Maybe it relates to health. Maybe it relates to the salvation of someone. Maybe it involves relationships. Maybe it's finances. It could be one of thousands of things that are a part of our lives and that we pray for and ask God to provide and to do for us and God waits and we're oftentimes tempted in those moments to say 
Why is he not answering? Is he not hearing us? Does he not care about what's happening? Does he not really want to provide? Is he not the good God that the Bible says that he is? And all kinds of doubts come into our experience in, in days or, or happenings like that. And yet, there is something that God knows that we don't know. And there's something that he desires to do in us before he answers the prayer that we're asking. And so we ask, we seek, we knock, and we keep on doing so, knowing that God is working in us to accomplish more than just to answer the prayer that we're praying. There's something bigger. There's something more important than just answering that particular prayer. He could do that. But He's seeking to work in our lives. And by the way, contrary to popular opinion, these two verses, 7 and 8, don't just offer us a blank check. You know, if you ask, you're going to get it. If you seek, you'll find it. And if you knock, well, it'll be open. That's the promise. But it's a promise that has to be understood in the context, of course, and in all that the Scriptures teach us about prayer. And over and over again, what you'll find is the Bible uh, doesn't doesn't describe praying to God as walking up to a vending machine, dropping in a few quarters, and pushing, you know, G7, and boof, there it is. And you just reach in and get it. That's not praying. God isn't a vending machine where we simply ask and then get whatever we want. That's not the mentality of Scripture at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. There are many conditions that the Bible gives us. Conditions like James 4.3, for example, that tells us, that uh, we need to ask with the right motives. And if we're not asking with the right motive, then God is not going to, to answer and provide the answer that we desire. And so there are many various conditions, and the condition that's set forth here for effective praying is being persistent. Being persistent. Continue to pray. Don't stop praying. Now notice what Jesus does in verses 9 through 11 is he illustrates it. Which again, he almost always does as he teaches here. There's always some way of, of taking us from what we know to something that we don't know. Because that's what an illustration does. It helps us to understand some aspect of what we don't know by sharing something that's familiar to us. Well, a bread and a stone and a snake and a fish were quite familiar things to Jesus' audience. And this is what he uses in verses 9, 10, and 11. He says this, Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him, will, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? <laughs> this is a wonderful way of illustrating Jesus' point, and He does it by giving us this contrast between earthly parents and our Heavenly Father. Our earthly parents, He says, are evil. Uh, that is, they have a sinful nature. They, they're, they're fallen. They're broken. Uh, they don't always think rightly about what their, their children are asking them. They want to do the right thing. They always want to do the, the best thing for their child. But at times, uh, they, they don't know what that is. And so they might, they might make one choice. Well, it, 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 it's proven a week or two later to have not been a very good choice. That's the life of an earthly parent. And he says, how different that is then for your heavenly Father, who's perfect, who by contrast is, is good, who is all wise and is loving toward us. He too desires to give us good things, but he always knows exactly what is the best thing to give us and just at the right time. So you have earthly parents contrasted with our heavenly Father. Earthly parents, well, they give good gifts to their children, if their children ask for something to eat, they're not going to give them a rock. How much more your Heavenly Father, who is good and perfect, and He desires to give what is good. But notice very carefully in these verses, Jesus makes it clear that what God gives us isn't necessarily what we ask for. 
And if we stop and think and reflect upon that, we probably have all had the experience over time of asking God for something. And then after a period of time goes by, maybe even years, we can look back and we're thankful that God didn't actually answer the way that we were asking Him to answer. Because we weren't aware of all the things, of course, that God was aware of. Jesus here doesn't say that whatever you ask for, that's exactly what you're going to get. No, you're going to get what your heavenly Father knows is best and good for you. It may be the exact opposite of what you're praying for. But God is good, and He will give good gifts to His children. The point is that God is our Father. We're in a relationship with Him. He's good, and He will always give us what's good. Well, that brings us to some points to ponder, some lessons to learn. And I have four that I'd like to share with you. The first one is, to receive, we must ask, seek, and knock. We have to pray. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't avoid that. As you read these verses, 7 through 11, it's very clear that you have to ask if you're going to receive. You have to, you have to seek if you're going to find, and you have to knock if it's going to be opened to you. In fact, in these five verses, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, you will find the word ask or something similar to it nine different times. So the emphasis is clearly on asking as Jesus teaches. In fact, look at how he finishes the 11th verse. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good? To those who ask Him. He doesn't simply say, how much more will your heavenly Father who is in heaven give what is good? He could do that, but He doesn't do it. That's not His determined purpose. That's not how He's going to function in His relationship with us. If you don't ask, you won't receive. You have to ask. You have to seek. You have to knock. I suppose it'd be a little bit like opening your front door. You know, you're going out to check, see if the paper's there. Or to see if it's raining out, or whatever it is. You open your door, and there's this guy standing there. What? Oh, I'm sorry, did, uh, did you knock? I didn't hear you. Did you ring the doorbell? No, no, I didn't, I didn't ring the doorbell. He's just standing there. What would you want to do? I mean, if, I would want to close the door and then lock it. Right? Because, okay... What? You're just standing there. You're in front of a door and you're not asking, you're not knocking, you're not seeking. This is what you do with a door. Mm. Yet that's what we can be like as children of God. Or a child we find crying and so we go to their room and, and uh, we, we hear that they're crying and, and there's a toy that's broken and they're very upset. It, it's been broken. And they continue to cry and continue to cry. And, and what do you do as a parent? You might say something, well, honey, I can fix this for you. Why didn't you come and talk to me? Why didn't you come and ask me? This would be the kind of thing we would expect our children to do. If, if our kids, as they're growing older and they're struggling with some aspect of their homework or something, can't you just hear yourself saying to them, well, why didn't you come and ask me? I can help you with that. We have to ask. This is what Jesus very clearly tells us. And if we don't ask, don't expect to receive. He's not simply going to give it to us. He wants us to act, ask. He wants us to seek. He wants us to knock. James 4.2 says it as clearly as any verse of Scripture. James writes and says, You do not have because you do not ask. So, here is an encouragement to pray. Second lesson or point to ponder. Here is encouragement to pray because our Heavenly Father will answer. This is the promise that Jesus gives. Now, if we take Jesus at His word, we're going to believe His promise. If we ask, we're going to receive. If we seek, we're going to find. And if we knock, it's going to be opened to us. This is exactly what Jesus promises. In fact, it's interesting in the eighth verse as He talks about you know, everyone who receives... 
uh, asks receives, and, and the one who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Literally, the verse reads like this. It, it isn't good English, but this is actually what Matthew recorded. He said, for everyone asking receives, and the seeking finds, and the one knocking, it will be opened. The one knocking, it will be opened. Notice that Jesus doesn't say that what is being asked for is what will be given. That's not what the 8th verse says. Rather, God will answer, but He will answer in a way that is best for us. And we say, oh, that is good, right? Because there are many times we ask for things that we think would be good, but in the end we realize they aren't. God is not going to give us something that isn't good for us. And again, our parenting relationship with our children or with with smaller kids that we might have a relationship with come to mind as we think about a child who comes with the sidewalk chalk in his hand and he says, Mom, can can I go and and, uh, make a big picture out in the middle of the street? Well, you know, no parent's going to say, sure, honey, that'd be fun. No, they're going to say, don't do that. You can't go into the street and, and use the sidewalk chalk. But you can do it here, do it in the driveway, do it on the back patio. Or, or you hear a child say, Dad, can, can I use your iPhone uh, to play games? Um, or maybe it's Papa, can I use your iPhone to play games? Uh, I used to say, yeah, sure, because you know, that's one thing that I can do for them. And frankly, um, well, they, they, re- they liked me a lot more when I did that, right? Right? <laughs> And so it was easy, it was very tempting to say, yeah, here it is, you know. Um, But uh, I knew that mom and dad didn't always like that. And so now what I say is, well, go ask your mom and dad. If your mom and dad uh, say, yeah, great. Giving people what they actually need and is best for them, of course, is exactly what God does. We oftentimes answer our children's requests by not giving them what they ask for because we know that there's something better. And so it is in our relationship with the Lord. Thirdly, we don't pray because we fail to see ourselves and God properly. You have to think about this for a while, I think. And ponder it. Because even though these verses are true, and we are encouraged to pray by Jesus, we probably find ourselves sitting here listening to this message this morning, thinking about how oftentimes we don't do what these verses are encouraging us to do. We don't pray, we don't seek, we don't knock. Why is that? Well, there may be many reasons, but I think there's two fundamental reasons why we don't pray as we should. And the first one deals with us, and the second one deals with God. The first one is about us, the second one is about our Heavenly Father. Um, The first one is the fact that we might see ourselves as self-sufficient. We don't properly understand how utterly needy we are, even for today. And and once we experience one day without really praying and asking God for anything, we find it all too easy to go two or three days or maybe a week, and then it's been a month and we really haven't asked God for anything. You ever been in a small group setting and, and you've had someone say, you know, as a question, something like, well, what are you guys praying for? What are you asking God for these days? And as you reflect upon that, you think, well... I guess I'm not really asking him for anything. I'm not really seeking or knocking about anything in particular. That can be uh, all too often the experience of our life. And ultimately it comes down to seeing ourselves as self-sufficient. We don't really see the need to pray because we don't really properly understand how needy we are but we are desperately needy. The other side of that coin is to understand, of course, our Heavenly Father. 
And it's a failure on our part to understand what God is really like. And that He is the God of of Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. He is the God who loves to give us not only good things, but that are the best for us at just the right time. Our Heavenly Father. I can remember now years ago um, asking my father to borrow the family car. We had one car. We were a family of nine. And so it was a large red station wagon, you know, with that last seat that turned and faced out the back window. You could put three, three, and three. You could put all nine members of our family in this large red station wagon. And I wanted to borrow that big red boat to go on a date with Lydia. The very first date I was going to take her on. The very first date I was ever going to go on. It was my very first date. Lydia is the only gal I ever dated. And uh, so here we were asking Dad for the keys to the car. I'm not sure why, but Dad was in the habit of, uh, well, not answering right away. If you'd ask him for something, did you have dads like this too? (laughs) I'm not sure why. Was he thinking about something? Was he just trying to make me squirm? I don't know. Um, I never got around to asking them that, I guess, before he passed away. But he was a good good earthly father. And... uh, and I was pretty confident that he was going to say, yes, you can borrow the car, but I had to come and ask, right? And so I come and ask, and Dad gives this long pause. Yeah, that's what he usually does, right? He doesn't, he doesn't answer. But on this particular occasion, almost right away, before I'd even ended the question, sure. <laughs> and it struck me as so odd, because here he was with such a quick response, and I'd never gotten a quick response like that. I think he was happy that his son was going on a date. I think is what it was. <laughs> and so I borrowed the car after asking him to, to use it for the, for the evening. Our, our Heavenly Father is anxious to give us the things we need without hesitation. Do we see Him that way? Do we see ourselves as needy? Do we see Him as one who's anxious to give us the good things that we need? And then the last question, or the last point to ponder is a question... What are you asking God for? What are you asking God for? What are you praying about? What are, what are two or three or four things that you repeatedly pray for over and over and over again? You're not stopping. You're not giving up. There should be that kind of list for us in our lives. Things that we would pray for over and over and over again and we would not stop until... An answer comes. It's interesting, in the parallel passage to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, you'll find that in Luke, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. So there's a lot of similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you go to to Luke chapter 11, you'll find some of this same teaching out of the Sermon on the Mount. But here in this passage where Jesus is talking about prayer and a heavenly Father who longs to give us good things, Jesus in Luke says this, He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your father, how much more will your father who is in heaven give the Holy Spirit to you who ask? Now, we already have the Holy Spirit as believers today in the church age. So, What is Jesus saying here as he communicates to his disciples that they will receive the Holy Spirit? Well, understand the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And come back to this question of what are you asking God for? Because we have been overwhelmed, have we not, by by what the Sermon on the Mount is calling us to live like. Jesus here in these verses tells us to be poor in spirit, to mourn over the sin of our lives, to be gentle to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, to be peacemakers, to be salt and light in our world, to be those who receive persecution because we're standing for Jesus Christ. He calls us here to to have this uh, connection with people in such a way that's without hypocrisy. He calls us to live a life that's free of lust. He calls us to, to say whatever we mean and to do what we say. He calls us in in chapter 6 to to pray and to fast and to to give in a way that doesn't have pretense, that doesn't put on a show. He calls us not to worry, to trust in our Heavenly Father. 
He tells us not to judge other people. He calls us to have discernment as we engage people that simply want to make fun of what we believe. Those are hard things. In fact, we'd have to come to the conclusion, I can't do any of that on my own. It's impossible. And that would be a correct observation. But through the Holy Spirit and the gift that He is to us, we're able to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. And we find ourselves growing in all of these areas as we submit ourselves to the work of the Spirit in our lives. We need the help. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is our helper. He's the one that's going to give us the grace that we need to deal with all of these and every other aspect of living for Christ. So what are you praying for? I want to encourage you to be praying for those things that are significant. The list that you find right here that Jesus addresses in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, as we come to the the last part, did I lose my slides again, guys? There we go. As we come to the last part, we come to the last verse of the Sermon on the Mount. That is the the body of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus concludes His sermon, really. The body of it right here in verse 12. You see the word therefore? In my Bible it says, in everything therefore. But you could put that at the beginning of the sentence as well. Therefore, in everything, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. So here, after addressing our relationship with the Heavenly Father, telling us to keep praying, He tells us, hey, what's your relationship to everyone to be like? Well, you are to treat people the way you want to be treated. That's how we go through life as followers of Jesus Christ. This, of course, is known as the golden rule. Jesus doesn't call it the golden rule. The Scriptures nowhere call it the golden rule. In fact, you'll find this basic idea 500 years before the time of Christ. But only Jesus Christ puts it in a positive light. And that's what He does in verse 12. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. And He says this essentially is the sum teaching of the law and the prophets, the Old Testament Scriptures. Notice what He says, for this is the law and the prophets. He doesn't say this is in the law and the prophets. No, he's saying this summarizes everything the Old Testament teaches about how followers of mine are to live before other people. He also doesn't say treat people well so that they will treat you well. That's not the motivation for the golden rule as Jesus describes it here. The issue is not how to manipulate others so that you'll be treated better but to demonstrate God's truth is taught in the law and the prophets. Because here is a summary of the law and the prophets. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. This is why the NIV translates this, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And the message paraphrase says it this way. Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. The golden rule. I don't suppose there's any better illustration of that than what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Today we come to the communion table. and We come to a table... Reminding, uh, being reminded again of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. I'm going to ask the men to come forward who are going to serve, and I'll ask you to bow your heads before the Lord. Thank Him for, for uh, the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Thank Him for your own salvation and for this table that reminds us of that precious life lived sinlessly and then laid down for us to pay the penalty of our sin only to take it back up again on the third day. Father, we thank You for this table. Thank You for the sacrifice of our Savior for us. 
Oh, how our life would be different without our knowledge of you and the wonderful gift, the unspeakable, matchless gift that you have given. Not just to us, but to the world. For Jesus came and died for all. We're grateful that he died for us as individuals, paying the price for our sin. Really removing the sin barrier that kept us from having a relationship with you. Sin has been paid for. Jesus did it perfectly and fully. Thank you for that. Thank you that our sinful life is no longer a barrier to knowing you. And that by faith we we can know you as our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us, who gives us just what we need. Father, we thank you for the reality of our relationship with you, and we know that that would be impossible without this table, without the bread that represents our Savior's body, and without the cup that represents his shed blood for us. Thank you that he gave his life. And Father, we thank you that he took it back up again, that you brought him from the grave, and he conquered sin and death. And uh, we rejoice in that because by our faith in Him, we have the same experience. We also have everlasting life. Thank you for these precious truths as uh, we come to this table and are reminded yet again of your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you give every good and perfect gift. We thank you especially for the perfect gift of your Son, whose body was broken for us. As we eat this bread, we just want to remember what a great thing you've done for us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for everlasting life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. Great God in heaven, <clears throat> we um, pause again before your throne just to reflect upon uh, the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. You know, um, many people give blood or plasma and that maybe saves a life or helps someone heal. But Father, uh, through your shed blood, we can all uh, be covered from our sins. And for this, we give you thanks. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Let's drink together. Well, this is a communion Sunday, so a number of our elders will be here at the front of our worship center. And if you'd like to come and have them pray with you, 
uh, they would love to do that. Boy, this is an appropriate Sunday to do that as we think about prayer. And if you're a guest here today, uh, you're welcome to come forward as well. Uh, Our elders would love to pray for or with you. If you're here as a guest or a a return visitor, then we welcome you to come and uh, uh, check out the information that's here just to the left as you exit our worship center. You'll find a welcome center there, information desk, a lot of literature there that you might pick up that will help you understand a little bit about CBC. And of course, if you're looking to attend that April 16 time called Discover CBC, uh, make sure you look for uh, Renee. She should be close by here and she can sign you up for that evening. We trust that this will be a prayer-filled week for you, right? We've been encouraged to pray, and so may we do that uh, this week. Lord bless you.